I might as well enjoy it now. You might, you might not like what I have to say. <laughs> um, you've had a lot of speeches, so I'm not going to take up a lot of your time. Just a, a few thoughts I'm going to share with you. Really. Um, I remember there was a time uh, when I was when I was as, as young as some of our younger comrades who are luckily happily coming into our party now. When I was just learning about socialism, I was learning about communism, Marxism, Leninism. When I was reading about the world historic. Uh, struggles that culminated in those 10 days that shook the earth, the revolution of the Soviet Union, I started to talk about myself as being a communist. As I'm a communist, and people would say to me, oh, are you going to go and live in Russia? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's nice in a way. There was, there was the Soviet Union still existing. But I, I would say yes. <laughs> uh, and it didn't occur to me at that time. My, my understanding wasn't strong enough to understand that it wasn't about going to live in a particular country. Interestingly, since I've been to North Korea, and there's a video presentation of my report back in North Korea, people started writing, if you love North Korea so much, why don't you go and live there? <laughs> this, I actually would love to go and live there. But, but that's not the point. The point is that wherever workers in struggle, socialism remains their ideology, their doctrine, the most concentrated ex, you know, expression of the strategy and tactics they need to guide them in their struggle to the point where we can stop being an oppressed mass who dream about a better future. To actually put us in a driving seat to take control of power, to put our work, our labour, our economy at the services of common people. And that's what socialism is. And that's what I, what I mean and believe when I say that I'm a communist and I know that my party will grow and will feel the same way. Our job, if you like, is to draw the necessary lessons from that doctrine, to absorb that information, to the, the struggles of the past, to pick out the essence of it, the living essence, to understand our country and how those things can apply to our country and how to move forward from here. And that's what we need to do together. Nonetheless, the experience of visiting socialist countries has been valuable and is invaluable, and I would encourage it for, for all of you. I've been lucky enough to visit both Cuba uh, in, in 1997 for the World Festival of Youth and Students, and I know in the forthcoming months and years, as our relationship with Cuba grows, we're anticipating going on a, on a party to party delegation to Cuba, I can, I can kind of announce today, if you like. Um, and also, last year, I was privileged, uh, along with several of my comrades, to visit the DPRK, an important time for it, when it was holding a, a very big uh, a, a conference to, to, to uh, reassert its goal of socialism and, and point the way forward. And that was a great honor and privilege. And both experiences were inspiring. I remember in 1997, this was not long after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Cuba was facing real difficulties. You can kind of look at Cuba now, I think it almost looks quite secure. There seems to be revolution throughout the Southern American countries and Cuba is very much at the center of it and we applaud that. <laughs> that tiny David that lives in the jaws of the, of the imperialist crocodile, in the jaws of the mighty imperial Goliath. And it was isolated at that time. And its economy that was built on cooperation with the Soviet Union was floundering at that time. And they were having real difficulties. Their difficulties in energy, their difficulties uh, in providing enough food, their difficulties providing decent jobs. They had a lot of difficulties. Their difficulties with dual economy, they tried to diversify their economy. And yet the people there were so happy to have us. They welcomed us with such warmth in their hearts. I remember a little girl who lived next door to us coming and shouting, Delegado, Delegado, because we were delegates you know, to the World Festival of Youth and Students. It had been such a big thing for them to host this big congress. They were, some of them, walking to work in order to generate enough fuel to heat and light and provide us with transport. These were the kind of sacrifices they were making. They recognized the importance of that international solidarity and they valued our presence and participation in their country so much. Uh, the DPRK was equally inspiring. It was equally inspiring to see as they constantly talked about their single-hearted hearted unity and struggle that gave them the strength to resist despite their division, despite them having a relatively small population, 23 million as opposed to the 50 million in the south, being faced with a state of continued war, of, of ceaseless war. Just the war that, it was a great victory that we rightly celebrate from 1950 to 1953 
And while it's the first time the U.S. has been forced to sign a peace treaty, the U.S. has never given up its ambitions to colonize and destroy the North Korean people. And they live day and night with those ongoing threats, with war maneuvers and military maneuvers around the periphery of their country. And that's why it's an inspiring example, not just to look backwards, but actually to see how they maintain their discipline, maintain their unity, maintain their strength and courage and go on and can build their economy and provide all of the things for their people that they do. They're inspiring struggle, in struggles, both of them, because they've shown us the relevance of, as, as everyone said, of internationalism, of proletarian internationalism, not just in their struggles, but in maintaining their struggles. Cuba you know, and, and Che Guevara has become an icon, like a poster boy. <coughs> Marx often wrote that working class heroes were sought to be turned into bourgeois icons after their death, but you divorce them from their revolutionary essence and celebrate them. And I wish that everyone who had a picture of Che Guevara on his t-shirt could remember the words of Che Guevara sometimes when he, for example, saw the work of the United Fruit Company, of this imperialist company in, in, in Central and Southern America, in subverting their democracy and overthrowing government. And he swore in 1953, as he said in his own words, I swore before a picture of our lamented comrade Stalin that I wouldn't rest until I'd overthrown these capitalist octopuses. Those are his words, not mine. Okay, so... Has, given us, has shown us that these countries, these two tiny countries, are not alone. They're part of a, a united struggle which has come down generation upon generation of revolutionaries who have fought with imperialism and have been inspired by the great October Revolution in the Soviet Union. The DPRK famously couldn't have maintained its victory without the tremendous international support, not only from workers all over the world, but the organized support of the Soviet Air Force and military, and of course there are millions of, I think actually a million Chinese volunteers, several hundred of thousands of whom gave their lives to ensure that the DPRK lived and that US imperialism was defeated. <laughs> Both countries show the importance of an organization. Comrade Mohammed Hassan said so clearly, you know, his country is a country which is rich and yet is poor. If you look at sub-Saharan Africa, it's a place where there's the greatest concentration of poverty on earth, and yet the greatest abundance of wealth and riches and natural resources bestowed upon it. And it's not a contradiction. So see, it's an apparent contradiction. There's a very real reason, and the reason is imperialism. The reason is capitalism. A world system that gives less than 200 billionaires the controlling stake in the world's economy, and yet half the world's population Three billion people live on two dollars or less a day. What a disgusting juxtaposition. Yes. Comrade Stalin, how right he was when he said the capitalists are our implacable enemies. Their wealth is built upon our poverty, their joy upon our misery. <laughs> his words are so clear his words are so clear and it's often the case that those whose message is truest seem to be reviled the most in society but I agree, ours is a movement that has been a proselytizing movement sometimes I feel a bit like a born again Christian <laughs> Good God. But, but only in the sense that our message has to grow and spread and we share that with them we are a proselytizing movement Some think that it's impossible that socialism can grow in Britain today. There are a number of reasons for it. I still say that our greatest act of solidarity with DPRK, our greatest solidarity act with China, our greatest act of solidarity with the people of Cuba is not just to visit there, express our you know, sincere love of their system, our happiness that they were victorious, but to actually practically implement their ideas here and to build a Soviet Britain. <laughs> but when you state the aim and it seems so far removed from your daily reality, people can just say that you're a bit crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so is it possible? 
why is it impossible that we should have socialism in Britain? We've got a long history of capitalism, we've got a long history of imperialism, we've got a long history in this country of our ruling class exploiting the whole world. My father comes from one of those nations, Mohammed Hassan comes from one of those nations. Mostly, if you look around the world, in fact, if you see that England is a multicultural place, that Britain is a multicultural place, what does it mean? It means that Britain, in all of the countries that were its former colonies, still has a certain degree of domination, still has a, a relationship where people are drawn from those former colonies into this country, whether they be uh, Turks, whether they be from the Indian subcontinent, whether they be from the rich parts of Africa and the Caribbean. Each of these people have a long history of oppression at the hands of British Empire. And there's a domestic working class who actually are as much Irish as they are English, who themselves have a long history of oppression at the hands of the British ruling class, but nevertheless have been taught a funny trick. A funny trick that in some way they're inherently superior to other members of the working class. In some way, they've got us all who have been fortunate enough to come into this country, Britain, to buy into the idea that aren't we the lucky ones? We're enjoying a relatively good standard of life, and therefore we divorce ourselves slightly from the faith of all people in the third world. Now, I know that you in this room are not guilty of it, so I don't lay the accusing hand on you. But it's a real phenomenon, a phenomenon we recognise. It's the phenomenon of having an aristocracy of labour, living off the crumbs of imperialism, exploitation of other countries. But we've also noticed that there's a banking crisis in this country, a real, genuine economic crisis of overproduction of capitalism that is causing real changes, that are causing imperialism to rethink the standards of life that it formerly granted to working people in our country. And as a result, those standards of life which we think divorce us from struggle are going down and down and down. As part of our program of ensuring that new mem members come to our party, are integrated into our party, uh, are politically able to contribute, are organisationally able to contribute, we're having a process of discussion with them and one of them said to me that they felt that now we are on the cusp of a time when we'll be writing a chapter in the pages of history that will be greater than October. And I actually agree with him. He said, working people are actually working up in there, looking at themselves in the mirror and saying they cannot continue in the old way. There's untold new avenues of exploitation and poverty which are opened up before even the working people of Britain, let alone the working people of the world. There was a real crisis. And revolution, I'm sorry to say, is associated with these periods of crisis. And much of their periods of pain, we haven't brought those periods of pain, we don't wish for the periods of pain. Imperialism generates these periods of crisis. It generates war, it generates poverty, hopelessness, helplessness, despair, suicide, uh, I, I, you know, such blackness where there should be hope. <laughs> there's no basis for it. If you look at the objective conditions, simply there's a ghost that stands in the way of working people working and producing the things that they need, and that's the ability of this tiny number of corporate uh, oligarchs to produce a hit out of the whole enterprise. Their system doesn't work. And when it breaks down, as it periodically does, it gives us an opportunity to build a new life. And new people are coming to our party. I was, I was touched by Mr. Zhang saying that he felt like he'd been among comrades struggling with us in the belly of the beast. And also that he's noted that we're growing because we are. You know, we put our, our speeches and our videos, if there are 100, 120 of you in the hall today, we put up our speech and 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 people can see it. And more and more, it's having an impact. The atmosphere in our country is changing, people are being drawn towards us. And what I learnt by going to Cuba and what I learnt by going to DPRK was the role of a party, the role of a party in galvanising struggle when people all want change and they all feel social injustice and they all want something to be different but they don't have their ideas focused, when they don't have their different movements brought together to channel, to recognise the main enemy, then they can be dissipated. They can be dissipated and they find themselves still in the situation, as Muhammad Hassan said, in his country, where they have a great country, a wealthy country, but a country which is a puppet of a foreign imperialist nation, and that the people's desires and aspirations are not met. I was recently making a, a, a video of Rapal's uh, a trip and, and, and a speech at a report about the meeting of Libya. And initially I put a Bob Marley track over at war, and I wasn't allowed to use that because. The copyright was held by a company that didn't want Bob Marley's radical lyrics associated with this. Um, and so I put another track on called by, by, by Loki, and he points out in the beginning of it 
that more, and this is a, you know, it's a, it's a relatively popular rapper, that more than 50 regimes have been overthrown by US imperialism since the Second World War. And this is what they do. And I've been reading a book about Grenada recently, a tiny country in the Caribbean, population of 100,000. You remember some of you had a revolution in 1979-1982, and there were tremendous advances that were, that they threw off their former dictator Gary, and Maurice Bishop was the great leader of that revolution, uh, and they started to really implement a, a period of health reform, a period of, of regeneration of the nation. And U.S. imperialism, the Bush the first, what did he do? He came on TV and he said, they're building a new airport in this country, a new airport with the help of this country, Cuba even though we told them to have nothing to do with Cuba. This is the enemy number one. They're a massive threat to us. They're a military threat to the world. A tiny country, 100,000 people sitting like a little green jewel in the Caribbean. U.S. imperialism, now 350 million then, it must have been 275 million population with the greatest armed forces on Earth. So what is it that they fear about these tiny nations all around the world? Ho Chi Minh famously said that nothing is more precious than independence and freedom. Yes. Nothing is more precious than independence and freedom. Because what they fear is the example. They fear the example that even 100,000 people in the English-speaking world can stand up and say, we will build our own nation from our own labor. We will not exploit another nation and we will show you that it's possible. That is what they fear. Bishop, when you read his speeches, reads like a liturgy of what some might call dogmatic Marxism-Leninism. <laughs> but let me tell you, when you put that dogmatic Marxism-Leninism in the process, in the mix, with a real mass movement, you connect it with workers' lives, they damn well understand the meaning and it ceases to be <laughs> And that is why we love honor, <laughs> not obey, but respect, <laughs> an example set by our countries struggling in socialist countries from the DPRK to Cuba, while we understand the examples that they've set us, and while we, I'm not going to read you all of the bits and pieces that I wanted to make comments on, because you can just go on forever, but while you realize that what they fear most about these countries are the example that they set. Yes. I'm not going to go through the lies one by one, the planks of the propaganda that imperialism constantly puts up. It's interesting when you see the Murdochs, <laughs> when you see them come before Parliament, even when they're readily being disciplined, the idea you get of the relationship of power between the Murdochs on the one hand and the Parliamentary Committee on the other. I personally felt that the Parliamentary Committee was like a, it was like a complete farce, it was like a joke. It was a fraud perpetrated upon us to make us think that these magnets of finance capital are somehow accountable to little old you and me. And we hate them, we hate them. Oh, well, they've been disciplined now, so everything's all right. <laughs> but what have they got? They've got their placemen. These are men who are so powerful, they have their man sitting with the Prime Minister. They have their man sitting with the head of the Metropolitan Police. They're the head of the, 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 the US, you know, of, the, of, the, of the US regime, of all powerful regimes in the world. They not only make the news, but they actually directly implement policies. Our own, our own <laughs> uh, Labour Party, um, which we're told is somehow different. We know that Tony Blair had to go out and see him and make a deal with him prior to getting support of the Murdoch press to get into office. We know that now Red Ed Miliband, whatever you want to call him, <laughs> apparently has made similar deals before even becoming the, the leader of the Labour Party. And it goes on and on and on and on. You see how these finance magnets by a thousand threads are linked to all the strings of power. But they, they can't be kicked out, they can't be, you know, they can't be replaced through a parliamentary mechanism. A new mechanism is needed. It's a mechanism of organisation. In fact, it's not new, it's a hundred years old. But as long as capitalism and imperialism stay in place, we're constantly saying the same mantra because it's constantly the same problems that present themselves, it's the same questions that, that, that we need to apply ourselves to and find a creative solution for. And the solution can be drawn from previous examples of struggle around the world when we look at it. So lastly, I just want to make, a, make a, a plea to you to help us to build this party. I'm a firm believer in it, the CPGVML. It's a broad party. I think there's a home for many differences of opinion within it as long as we are 
fundamentally facing the same enemy, that we recognise imperialism is our main enemy, that we understand that the Labour Party and the parliamentary system are fundamentally planks of imperialism, not opposed to it, um, and that we understand that through study, through education in the first instance, and organisation ultimately, and yes, ultimately through military means. We are able to sweep the system aside, that we can make a contribution back to those comrades that we rightly laud and support for the contributions they've made, that we can make a real difference, that we can write our chapter in history, that one day they can sing songs about you, <laughs> not just Lenin. So I'm going to end with Lenin's final quote, um, which I think I want, to take, I, want, I want you all to take to your hearts. It was an old one that we used to write in, on the banner of every edition of Spark back in the day when we were in the, in the socialist workers, the socialist labour yeah. volunteer. <laughs> 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 Never socialist workers. <laughs> and that is that the workers are gunpowder and knowledge and education are the spark. So I, 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 I salute.